I'm your producer, Todd Bartu, and this is the Offshore Explorer. Offshore Explorer looks at the world from the sailor's point of view, port by port. Together, we share stories that detail the important intersections between sailing culture and life, past, present, and future. Let me introduce our host, a lifelong sailor who has traveled the world, from mega yachts to tugboats to ice boats, and a published author who has written for both stage and screen. Captain Scott Todson. Hello, Todd. How are you today? It's a little cloudy and misty down here in the marina in Santa Monica, Santa Monica Bay. Um, it looks like the weather is starting to change, and um, we'll be soon going into that whole June gloom, which is very Southern California. And if you don't know what that is, it uh, will have heavy clouds, um, fog. It'll last um, until about 11, 30, 12 o'clock, and then the sun will come out and it'll be bright and sunny. Um, but all morning it'll be cloudy. Uh, yeah, it sounds like, a, sounds like typical Southern California weather. This time. Yeah, very, yeah, very, very typical, very typical. It's hard to keep a boat clean with all this nonsense, that's for sure. Not so yeah, much sometimes I wish it would just rain instead of threatening to rain. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, two. That's here. We get three drops of rain. Everybody's in a panic. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so it seems like uh, you know we're getting a lot of uh, new fans, new listeners all around the world. Uh, and shout out to our fans in Iceland and in Russia and Switzerland. Um, we've had uh, great feedback from everybody. And you know, be sure to go and check out Offshore Ships Locker for all your sailing needs. Uh, anything you need to to kit out your boat, it's a good place to go to find items that we endorse um, as you know, good quality product for your boat. Um, oh, one other thing I did want to mention is that you know we have a lot of listeners that have either recently bought a boat or thinking of buying a boat. And I would actually suggest, since, since it is that time of the year when a young man's heart or woman's heart goes to the ideas of getting a boat, going and check out our Buying a Boat uh, series. It's a two-part series, and it, t- it tells you a lot about what you need to know about you know, what to do once you buy it, how to buy it, what to do, and, uh, and ev- all the information that you need there. So I would definitely recommend going to check that out. Um, now that that's out of the way, what do we have in store for today's episode? Well, today I wanted to take us back to um, a little bit of sailing. And one of the reasons we like to go sailing is because we like to go to places that are cool. And this uh, episode is titled Chateau Béchavel. Um, it is a beautiful chateau in the St. Julien Medoc region of uh, France, the Bordeaux region. And it is right on the Gironde River. Now, the Gironde River is part of a river, but it's mostly an estuary. And it's the largest estuary in uh, Western Europe. And it's a very interesting place to sail. You've got to be paying attention because you could run aground very easily. There's a lot of sandbars, etc. But there is a lot of commercial shipping that goes through there. So it's, you know, it's not that difficult. But I had a great deal of anxiety and I talk about how to handle the the ebb and the flow and the tide and the current of sailing in a river. Um, A river, an estuary that becomes a river, actually becomes two rivers that breaks off into a canal, the Canal du Midi. And it goes across uh, the southern part of France, just below the Pyrenees, and uh, empties into the Mediterranean. So it's kind of a shortcut, but there's limits to the size of the boat that can go through there. But it's, it's a bucket list place that's absolutely beautiful. And I spend a great deal of time talking about wine and specifically wine from Chateau Bechevel, where I had the opportunity to do the Vendage. Okay, great. Take it away, Scott. I like to think of a bottle of wine as a kind of collection of memories. Uh, In that bottle from the early 
earliest moments of flowering. The vine has recorded the scudding clouds, the gentle rains, the fog, and in this case, the taste of salt air, the absorption of minerals from the soil left so long ago in the estuary and the effluence of both the Gironde and the Garonne rivers, depositing minerals and soil from high in the Pyrenees down into the Aquitaine Plain and out to the Atlantic Ocean. There are centuries of Gaelic cultivation of some of the best wines in the world and some of the best food in the world. So a quick thing, I was motoring past uh, Point de Grave in Bordeaux. It's a distance of about 73 kilometers. Cordouin Lighthouse marks the entrance to the estuary. Um, coming in from the Atlantic, it's um, extremely well marked. Um, it can be a little rough. It reminds me a little bit about sort of the end of the Chesapeake Bay kind of idea for those Americans who have sailed on that. Um, maybe closer to the Delaware Bay um, as far as uh, the effect of the river and the tides. So it's a, it's a kind of an interesting place. But I wanted to talk about some of the dealings that you have to go through when you're dealing with a river and an estuary and uh, the tide, um, the current from the river, the flow, and, and, and how to sort of uh, um, keep your nose, so to speak, um, into the flow. So this lighthouse, the Cordouin Lighthouse, is, marks the entrance to the estuary. And at low tide, it's very spooky because there's just nothing but uh, these long, um, sandy flats that show themselves. And between the flats, there, there are little rivers or creeks that you could take your boat through. Now, the deepest part of the port's entrance is very well marked. And for those who think they're just going to be, you know, doing this sort of dangerous slide by a sandbar kind of thing. It isn't quite that way. Um, it is, it's very well marked and big, and big container ships do go through there. So, and it's, it's been going through there for, for centuries. So there's a lot of water at this part of the estuary and there's a lot of like, you know, it's, it's like history every four feet kind of idea. And if you're a history buff and you're a sailing guy or woman, then, then this is going to be your, this is, this is like the ultimate. Because ultimately, all the work of getting up this river to Bordeaux, which is the location that I'm going for, um, the reward of a fine wine and food is just extremely extremely happy for a guy like myself and I hope for you too so it's interesting about the lighthouse because it's still actually manned um, it's been a historic site um, since the 18th century it used to be monks that were up there and kept the fires burning so you could see it and all along the coast of, of France and Spain and Portugal there's a lot of lighthouses, and I get in, I'll get into a whole thing with lighthouses because they represent not only um, a navigational standard um, to help sailors uh, navigate through these waters, but they also sort of represent um, uh, the power and wealth of the city that, or town or area that has erected these lighthouses and how they're maintained. So anyway, the uh, Cordon Lighthouse is one of the most famous lighthouses in France. And it's um, you used to be able to walk out to it, but now you can't because it's you have to take a boat to get to it. Um, and it sits on a spit, and there's usually two guys in there at all times. This is one of the greatest uh, waterways in the world. Um, this estuary is the largest in Western Europe. Um, it's the beginning of a truly amazing gastronomic voyage. Okay, 
um, all that one might know as French, such as red wine, oysters, mussels, fresh everything, cheese, sweets, cakes, breads. You go on and on and on and on. It is here for the intrepid yachtsman. So navigating these waters takes some skill in knowledge of handling the tides, some local knowledge, which you should always try to get, of river flows, of sandbars and, and silting and other things. But I found for the most part on this trip that I had a lot more anxiety about the navigation aspects of it than was warranted. So a little history about what we're dealing with. The Garonne, which is the name of the river, rises up from the Pyrenees, and it drains a large part for the large for most of the water goes into the Aquitaine Basin. Okay, and this is a navigable tidal river, and it also has two short sections. One is in Toulouse, which is like five kilometers long and includes one lock. It's kind of nowhere. Um, it's interesting because Toulouse uh, is where they build all the air buses and Dassault jets, etc. Et so if you're an aviation fan, this is it's a very cool place, and there's this great museum there um, about French aviation, which is really important and fun to do. And um, I, I mention this is because the offloading of parts by ship, fuselages, etc., happens in Bordeaux just up the border. So just to give you another indication that that the tidal river is is deep and commercial and um, one shouldn't be too afraid to go down that river. So then there is a, a lot. There are a series of locks just beyond Bordeaux. And a lot of the this lock will take you through the Canal Midi, which is a canal that goes uh, from the Garon, the combination of rivers, and the canal goes all the way through over across France and into the Mediterranean. Now, a lot of people make this trip. I have never made this trip. Uh, I would love to make this trip. Um, it's very kind of slow. Um, you're not going to be able to take your big ass sailboat through there because. Um, I think the depth of the water all the way through is only like 1.8 meters. So, you know, even if you go by two, that's six, that's six feet. Um, it's not a lot of draft and, and the height of going under the bridges and stuff, you could never keep your, um, your mast up. You'd have to demast and carry your mast with you. So there's a lot of navigation stuff to do with the locks and running with the tides and how to make uh, the flows go. And mostly that goes from the cold to Castanets de Dorthe, which is a distance of about 70 kilometers. And there the channel uh, changes and becomes fully navigable as a tidal stream. And there's this where the junction for the Canal Garon and uh, Castanets de Dorthe uh, take place. It's a very cool little place. I've never sailed it, but I have actually physically um, stood on the docks and watched the, the boats go up and down. It's kind of cool. But it's the main waterway to go from um, southern France, from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. And the point, the place that I was going to is Pointe de Pierre in Bordeaux. That's where the river is really sort of a maritime waterway. So if you're coming in from the Atlantic Ocean, okay, you're going to come up this river and you're going to go uh, all the way to Bordeaux, which is about 54 kilometers. And once you get there, uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful little marina right next to the submarine pen that the Germans built. It's kind of interesting. And um, the Italians also were there as submariners. I didn't know that. And it's, it's just like there you are in downtown Bordeaux. It's like the best, the best of all worlds because Bordeaux is simply one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It is just, it's 18th century architecture everywhere. It's gorgeous. Um, 
and the people are super nice. It's a kind of it's the kind of conservative hub of of France as opposed to Paris, which is far more liberal. Um, but it's still one of the most interesting places, and of course Bordeaux is the the home for uh, French red wines. Something you should note: there's a thing called a boar or a uh, mascaret, which is when uh, during low flow periods and the river starts to uh, fill up with the, with the ocean, it pushes the water into it, and it starts the tide comes in. It creates this, and this this happens like forty kilometers upstream from from Bordeaux. So it's nothing that we worry about in Bordeaux, but the the tide pushes up and it creates this wave. And this wave, uh, people surf this wave. They can actually surf for about seven miles. People are in kayaks and surfing. There's a couple of YouTube videos that are out for this. And it's, you know, it's, it's pretty hilarious. And, um, if, if you're out in that area with your boat, you've, you've managed to get, you've gone up that far. Um, it's not, it's not hard. You just put the bow into this, this wave and you'll know it's coming. Um, and, and you'll just ride over. It's just like a little sea wave. It's not a big deal, but it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great wave for, um, for sailing. So some, some basic stuff about the waterway itself is you can't get under any of the bridges. It's six, six and a half meters, 12, 13 feet. So, you know, any boat of any kind of size is not going to be able to get through with its its mass. But you can get all the way up to Bordeaux before you get to um, the bridges, okay? And even in some cases, if you do lower your mass, which you could do right there in a marina because there's a shipyard next to it, you can, you can go. But the max draft on that is like 1.8 meters, okay? So you're talking about just under six feet. And... Um, so this is this is the whole uh, navigation thing. I should note, though, the flow of the river downriver when um, the tide is going out is about four knots, and and the difference is uh, depending on whether it's a high tide, spring tide, nep tide, is around uh, three to four uh, meters, which is, it's pretty high. Um, but it's, it's kind of like normal in that particular part of, of France and of England is the same way. And, you know, it's, it's kind of important to know that. I should say that, you know, you've got to, pa- you know, plan these passages, especially with the tides and currents. You got, you got to like, you got to be prepared, okay, to go when the ebb um, happens. It's and I'll give you a couple of little small. Um, the downflow ebb happens approximately two thirds of the time, and the upstream flood is about a third of the time. So this means that the flood is much stronger than the ebb, particularly during the hours of high water for and high water three, three and four hours. The part of the, um, it's, I mean, it's obvious, but, you know, when you come around uh, you, uh, Point de, P- de Pierre and Bordeaux, you got to be hitting this stuff right on the nose. So here's the thing. You enter the uh, Point de Grave, which is the point that you enter to get into the estuary near the lighthouse, Okay. And you link up the tidal times from there, okay? Um, high water in um, Pulak is about one hour after uh, Point de Grave. And then in Bordeaux, it's two hours after Point de Grave. And then Cassettes is four hours. But if you're just going to Bordeaux, so you've got two hours to do about 43 kilometers um, in and out, right? So that's kind of... You know, it's more technical than I normally do. But also, the the section from the Mediterranean to Bordeaux is they have a number of places that they call ports. Well, they're not really ports. They, they used to be docks, okay? 
And one of the great pleasures of sailing on this river is seeing all the chateaus that line the river. They're just, I mean, it's gorgeous. It's, it's magical. Be prepared for fog. There is a lot of fog in the area. And it's just, it's just a magnificent um, green verdant, you know, rows and rows and rows of uh, vineyard. Um, it's just, it's a fantastic and beautiful um, environment to sail down the river. It does remind me in a certain kind of way, the beauty aspect of it, the, the fundamental like, wow, kind of beauty is, is going up the Hudson River up to Albany. Um, after the um, uh, the Tappan Zee, once you get up past the Tappan Zee, it really gets gorgeous up there, and and it's just it's really cool. But any kind of river passage that you do, you have to be very careful about keeping your speed um, going with the flow, as they say. Is on a river thing is something I really don't want to do. Um, I'd rather go against the flow because it gives me more control, it gives more water over the rudder. I keep, I can go in the right, you know, I can control the direction I want to do. And it's very important, for example, when you're going against the flow and you're, and you want to go into the marina. Now you got a four knot current, let's say coming at you and you're going and your engine's just, you know, cooking along. I mean, especially if you're a six, seven knot boat, right? Um, you're, you're just above the point of being able to manage any kind of control. So you come up, and the best thing to do is to go into it and to come to the dock by going into the flow. So always keep your bow into the flow and then move over to the dock the best way you can. Get a line on there and hang on to that dock for dear life. Coming down with the flow and trying to get into a dock is just going to create just, it's a disaster, okay? Because you're going to go A, too fast, and, and B, you won't have control. Um, it's just, it's just too much. Um, so it's really important to, uh, skip that kind of nonsense. Always go up upstream, uh, when you go to dock. Now my trip, uh, down this, uh, down the river was, or I should say my trip up the river was really, really cool. Um, we motored along you know, we, we picked up the tide. Um, it was very clean. Um, we passed all sorts of really cool stuff as far as the, the, um, the chateaus, we get into a little bit more of an industrial area. Then we come up to these islands that are part of where the rivers sort of come into the estuary and there's ferry terminals up there. There's, um, uh, cranes and pump ways and you know there's lots of place where you could you know you could put your boat and some of it's actually quite cheap you know 20 20 30 euros a, a night um it's yeah it's cool um and everybody is very very kind um and, which makes it really kind of neat and uh, so that's kind of the whole concept of being able to maneuver your boat in tides Keep the bow fro forward and always, you know, always give yourself some latitude and make sure that you find out as much as you possibly can about um, what the local conditions are. Because in a river, there's a thing called silt and that happens all the time. Another thing is, is to beware of the buoys. I know that um, my, my friend Tim B. at C over on YouTube um, we had talked about uh, buoys and and you know how there's how they can be just you know hanging on for dear life and you can see the current around them. Make sure you pay attention to what those buoys are doing and try not to get your boat anywhere near them because um, they're big, they're steel, they're heavy, and they will rip a hole in your boat if you hit one. So I've seen it happen. Um, it's it's not fun and. That's why the idea of staying in control and not allowing your boat to drift um, with the crossing. Um, I used to, in New York Harbor, I used to run my tugboat and my barge. And even in New York Harbor, which the current 
coming down the Hudson River, the North River is is not that great, not like it is up here in Bordeaux, but it's it's enough to to move a barge sideways. So you have to kind of turn it on an angle in the flow if you're going to go and 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 gauge how much drift you're going to have because that's where your whole drift and set thing comes in. You're going to have to gauge how much because literally um, I saw, I read somewhere where they talked about it's almost like a moving sidewalk, right? You're on a moving sidewalk and where you want to go to is something that's off the moving sidewalk and, and, and you have to like run up the sidewalk in order to get to it or you, you know, you're just going to pass it by. And that's sort of how river flow works. You just, you just, you just can keep on going. Um, another thing is to, to just as a little sailing thing is um, to make sure that when you tie your boat up, that you use two springs, a bow and a stern. Okay. Because what you're going to do, your bow is going to be facing the flow of the river and you're going to be sitting there. You're going to take the bow line off, and the bow is going to begin to move away from the dock. You take your stern line off, okay? And you can take your um, uh, aft spring off, and that'll only leave you a forward spring. Now, that forward spring, if you just give it a little gas, that forward spring is going to keep coming out. It'll allow the bow to get out, get out, get out. And it will, if there's a boat in front of you, which most of the times there are in these areas, um, you'll be able to, to pull out of your parking spot, so to speak, with that. And then just pull in your F spring and then poof, you're, in, you're into the, the river stream. Now, a lot of rivers, the stream is more intense in the middle than it is um, on the sides. Um, the sides obviously have more dangers. So be aware that there is a change in the speed of the current as far as that's, that's concerned. So this whole tide and time and tide and wind and all the rest of this stuff. And, and, and you know, we're talking about here um, boats with power, okay? Um, people sailed up this river. Um, they rode the tide, you know, tide, time and tide wait for no man, and both move on relentlessly and are constantly changing. And so lots of sailors, they literally had to sail all the way up to Bordeaux. Or they had to sail and they had to row, one of the two. But they had the, they had the time and the tides just exactly right to get in and out of all these rivers. Um, lots of great passages in the Master and Commander by Patrick O'Brien about um, waiting, catching the tide and, um, you know, getting these giant, giant sail, sailing ships um, to move down the Thames with the tide because um, it's the only way they were ever going to get out. And then picking up a breeze and being able to get out, it could, it could take them like days to get out um, past the land. Um, it's it's a, a real skill set that you could develop. And I've, I've played with the idea of pulling out and, and trying to, you know, sail, um, on my own with no power. And, um, you know, boaters pass me looking at me like I'm a complete idiot, but you know, I don't care. I just, I wanted to develop the skill. And I, I did that actually in an emergency thing, um, uh, up in Oregon, which is good. The Columbia River up there. It's a horrible river. I had a, I had an engine go up there and went. It went out on me, and I literally had to sail up the river, um, which is one of the worst rivers you could sail up to in terms of current and, and all the rest. That gets just it's just an ugly little place. But it's a good skill for you guys to learn on sailing your boat in tight spots without power. But first, do it with power, get used to the feel, and then go from there. So I settled into the harbor right next to the old submarine base. And we were put on um, uh, a pontoon on the outside where we could feel the effects of the river. 
And for me, it wasn't wasn't a big deal. But like I said, I had the bow facing the river flow. And the best part of the journey for me was beginning. It was the eating and drinking part. This area is really known, of course, for wine. But it's also known for oysters. They have been cultivating oysters there forever. And one of the things that they do with oysters is they drink champagne with them. Or they drink a white wine that comes from Bordeaux. The, the, the Bordelais wine is, there's only about 10% is white. I think that 10% is probably drunk in this one restaurant where they serve the oysters and mussels. And, and it's just, it's amazing. So you would think... Okay, oysters and champagne sounds to the American ear like, okay, this is a little little fancy. But you know, in America, um, we ate a lot of oysters. You've been down South Carolina. Um, you know that they have those cluster oysters down there, which, is, which are crazy good. And up in New England, they got the oysters and, and, and mussels and, and all over the place, and, and the blue crab and the blue soft shell crab and all the rest of this stuff, and we drink beer with these. Now, why is that? Well, we, we drink beer because it's part of the tradition, but the tradition happened because uh, no one in America was making sparkling wine or champagne. And I should note that champagne comes from champagne, which is in France. Anything else is champagne-like. Okay, it's a sparkling wine. It's, it's based on the region itself. And the, these rules about where wine comes from, what growth this wine is, these are all very important, very important rules that are followed by all the world, even in America. And it's very, very important. So I love oysters, okay? And I love, I love um, uh, mussels. I do this little recipe of, you know, steaming in uh, garlic and olive oil and white wine and just steam the sucker out of those things and just eat them hot right out. That's that's my little recipe and lots and, and lots of like parsley and some basil, play around with all that kind of some parsley and some basil, that kind of thing. And it's good. It's really, really good. Um, I could eat an entire bucket of these in one sitting without talking period the oysters themselves have a interesting history in bordeaux that the original um, indigenous um, oysters have basically died out and they were replaced by a, a species of japanese oyster so you actually will get the same type of oyster um, when you go to Japan as you will when you go to Bordeaux. Bordeaux. But what's really interesting is, is that the oyster, there's oyster and mussel um, farms all along the river and they get, they get lots of, of uh, movement and, with the water and they're, they're very healthy and very tasty. Um, and one of the first things I do when I, I'm there and, and one of the first things I did when I was there was in the restaurant, I would order the fruta de mer. Fruta de mer is a platter. Okay, it's all got ice and it's all seafood, all the crustaceans you could possibly think of. Crab, langoust, little lobsters, urchins, uh, oysters, mussels, okay, uh, shrimp, you you name it. It's it's on the platter, okay? And that with a bottle of champagne or a very tasty, clean white wine from Madoc just down the river will blow your mind. I'm just going to say, it'll blow your mind. If you don't like that, then I, I, I can't imagine what you would like because that to me is one of the most incredible gastronomic meals I could ever I could ever imagine
So why I'm sitting in this restaurant, which overlooked the river, and I was talking to the waiter, and he mentioned the Vandage. Now, the Vandage is the time of year that the great vineyards um, pick the grapes. They, they time it, they look at the weather, they look at the sunshine, they check the sugar content of the grapes themselves. It's a very specific kind of thing. And when they say go, they mean go. And what they do is they hire people to come and work, okay? And it is, it is really, really hard work, okay? Um, the mostly, uh, they're day workers because, you know, the vineyards don't need that kind of stuff. Not a lot of people around all the time. And um, I had done it once before in Pennsylvania. A friend of uh, our family had a little vineyard he used to make a little muscadet kind of wine. And, and it was good. And, and um, we were invited. You know, he was always trying to get people to come up and, and, and help him pick the grapes. Um, and, and the thing is, is that, I mean, I'm thinking that when he was doing, he had maybe 10 rows probably about 100 yards long. Well, in the Vandage here, these these things are, these rows and rows and rows and rows and rows are like miles long. I mean, the amount of, of stuff, of wine that's there is ridiculous. Just in this area, the Bordeaux area, they produce over 9 million bottles of wine every year it's a lot of wine it's a lot of wine so anyway we got hooked up through the waiter to to uh go out to a chateau um to to pick to pick wine um it was a i signed up uh, you have to sign up on this sign up sheet and um they uh, said okay you have to you have to be here at um at uh, at four o'clock and four o'clock in the morning, four thirty in the morning, and we would take a bus out to the chateau. This this I was excited about doing this, and most of the people that got on the bus were either you know Albanian, um, some kind of migrant workers, some Portuguese, some Spanish, um, a number of people from Paris, uh, a couple of Greeks. Any case, this it was a kind of nice, jovial, uh, friendly. Uh, nobody had a common language kind of thing, and half the people didn't speak very good French and everything else like that. But we were all in this bus, yellow school bus kind of thing, and we were going to go up to uh, Chateau Bechevel. Now, just a little bit of understanding about what it's like being in this area and sailing on this river okay you know the uh, they used to call this the port of the moon they still do and it supplied a majority of europe with coffee cocoa sugar cotton you name it and it was at one time france's busiest port it was it was only second busiest to london and all of this period was a lot of coming and going because in the 18th century, a lot of this stuff was coming from uh, the Caribbean and specifically Haiti. And even the majority of slave trade um, to France um, took place and came through Bordeaux. Um, in fact, they, the Bordeaux ship owners um, sent some 150,000 Africans to to Bordeaux is not a particularly good period for the French at this point, but they did have a revolution, and during that revolution, when Napoleon rose up, they freed, they stopped, and they outlawed slavery, and there was a revolution that took place in Haiti, a very famous one. Um, that's for another podcast at a different time, and at that point, all the. Fr- all the slaves were free, and this little um, golden island for the French, uh, as far as making money, which is all about making money and making power, um, they lost it, and it stopped. 
and um, the French basically took the side of of being anti-slavery, even though Napoleon tried to reinstate uh, slavery again, um, nobody would have any of it. So it does have this sort of dark side, as all shipping and mariner activities do. There's good, bad, and evil, okay? This is part of the evil part of it. So the whole time that I'm taking this bus and we get to the chateau, and you have to look at the pictures of the Chateau Becheville because um, the place is stunningly beautiful. I mean, it is just like, whoa. I mean, it'll, it'll take your breath away. And we're out there. We start it at about 5.30, 6 o'clock. And there was a dense kind of wet fog, which is very much indicative of the area. And we had these shears, which, by the way, are so sharp. Um, cut your finger off if you're not careful. And we had baskets. And we just started at one side of the row and just started clipping. off. And the grapes were beautiful. They're big. They're juicy. They're red. They were filled with the moisture of the air. So they, they looked like pictures. Um, they looked almost not real but you know we had gloves shears and we didn't have time there was there was an urgency in the air that we had to push through and work really hard now some of the albanian guys who had been there before uh they went right at it and i sort of took their their lead and said okay i'm going to just really crank on this and there's no talking there's you know there's a little bit of talking of course everybody talks but you know, it's just out there. And I didn't have to be out there. That's, that's the point. Is I didn't have to be out there doing a vendage. It was just something I wanted to feel. I wanted to feel, you know, like the Romans had brought the first uh, cuttings uh, from Spain to this area. And, and, you know, this is like 100 BC. And they started, you know, growing wine there. The Romans were big at this. Then they end up getting defeated. Okay. And then... Another group takes over, okay? And there was a sort of a dynasty thing going on. And then the Vandals showed up. And and they attacked. Then the Visigoths and the Franks, which are or, or, or kind of German. And, and this whole area was run over. It wasn't, you know, until like... It wasn't until like the 6th century um, that the, the Frankish... Um, royal Frankish uh, kingdom um, started to play a role as a major urban center. Okay. And they created these duchies and they made a court out of Bordeaux and they fought the Basques in Spain. And well, the ba there's French Basques and Spanish Basques, which are, you know, where the river comes from up in the Pyrenees. And just a beautiful, more, it's like more beautiful than more beautiful than more beautiful than more beautiful. So eventually you get history passes, um, you have wars, um, but the vineyards keep, keep growing and wine is being produced. And then in the 12th to like 15th century is what they call the English era. And in this part of, of France, um, England owned it for a long, long time. And there was a lot, Henry II is a, Henry II of Plantagen um, from the uh, Count of Anjou. Um, it's very interesting, was a very interesting guy because he comes from the line with Edward um, the first, second, and third. And Edward um, II is often referred to as the Hamlet King. Um, you also have the, the Black Prince, the Prince of Wales, um, and the siege at Calais, which is a little further, way further north. But they all roamed this idea, the Siege of Calais. You may know the Rodin sculpture of the Burgers of Calais, which is the figures coming out with chains and whatever and 
this was a kind of, you know, this is this whole place has got this sort of heavy, detailed history about it. And still at the same time, it was just this wonderful place, simple place to grow and cultivate and 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 make wine. So in the 18th century, which is the port of the moon, um, after all of these expeditions, the French Revolution, okay, you had the the wars between the the French and the English and the Duke of Wellington and you know all these guys and all of this kind of insane warfare, which I'll get to at a different time. And then finally, uh, it all calmed down, and the French had their place. Um, Bordeaux created the first uh, bridge. Bridges across Bordeaux were built in the 19th century. Warehouses were created. The shipping traffic grew um, through the new African colonies. Um, and Bordeaux became, in fact, a kind of large-scale uh, Paris. Um, it was a very, very, it became very famous. Uh, it became very, very wealthy. Um, it was a place where uh, the Franco-Prussian War, uh, when the Prussians were getting close to Paris, that the government, the French government, located to Bordeaux. Um, and then even in the 20th century, the, you know, Bordeaux fell to German occupation. I mean, we all remember the, the World War II and, and D-Day and all the rest of that kind of stuff. I mean, there was this port was immensely important. It was a submarine base there, and it was part of the Battle of the Atlantic, and that's where U-boats were headquartered. Um, and there, the U-boat pens are still there, and to go and look at them is kind of interesting. They have a cultural center there, so that was kind of cool to see. But getting into Bechevel is a kind of interesting place. And I didn't know Chateau Bechevel. It is the, uh, it's a fourth growth, um, Grand Cru. Um, the wines there are, are wonderful um, overall. They produce a ton of wine. Um, they have improved over the years. Uh, their best vintage, from what I understand, is in 1982, um, which is an interesting year all the way around for the area. But the chateau uh, was built by the first Duke of Eperon. And he had a reputation as a great French admiral. Now you see where I'm going, right? You see that I'm tying in the sailing with the wine and the vineyard owned by a French admiral. And such as it is, is that, and I had passed it, is that uh, you pass in front of the estate and sailors would lower their sails to show their allegiance to the admiral. And this was a deep mark of respect, and um, it became the chateau's emblem. So if you look at the, the bottle, you'll see a griffin-shaped uh, prow, and it, its name is Gascon, and it says um, Becavella, or meaning you know, basse vole, which is lower your sails. And later, that sort of came into the word Bechevel. Now, another interesting thing about Bechevel is the Admiral was, of course, extremely wealthy. And if you look at the chateau, it's, it's enormous. But he used to support the arts, and he had Mol Moliere used to come and perform there. So there's this, you know, there's this, like, really kind of interesting you know, history. Um, they have this famous cedar tree. Um, they've developed a lot of, of things. And, um, you know, Bechevel, uh, the owner of Bechevel visited Louisiana, where he married a, a girl from there, his young American wife, who suffered very badly from seasickness. And during their honeymoon on the Mississippi, she vowed never to set foot on a boat again once she had arrived in France. 
her husband, hoping that uh, with the Gironde flowing beside Becheville, would remind her of her native land, but it never did. So he built a, a new wing on the left side of the chateau, and it's still dedicated. It's dedicated to her, and um, it still evokes uh, um, Louisiana. And, and 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 this is this is how she kept from being homesick, which was kind of a big thing. And there's lots of letters, love letters, and, you know, the harvest is just, you know, just this amazing, amazing thing. So let me just say what we did. So I spent all morning working my butt off, cutting these grapes, and putting them in a basket, taking the basket, and putting them in these big bins, and going and going and going. And the foreman of the place came over and he, and he said to me, are you an American? And I said, yeah, I am. I said, and he goes like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I said something, I love wine. And I always wanted to participate in, in a vendage, especially out here in, in St. Julien in Medoc and, and Bordeaux area. And it's, to me, it's a very sort of special sort of, I'm creating my own memories around these bottles of wine. And we talked a little bit more, and I told him, yeah, well, I have a boat. I sailed up the river. I sailed past you, and I'm in Bordeaux, and I just signed up because I love the food. I love the thing. So he said, come with me. So he came. He, he took me into the, the main house, and this is where I learned about the Louisiana connection. Um, I also learned that the... The, there was a disease, and I forget the name of the disease, that just devastated the vineyard at one time. And they ended up getting the cuttings for the Cabernet Sauvignon from Missouri, of all places. So there's a sort of really interesting American touch um, on this beautiful 17th century um, uh, chateau and, and this wine production that's going that started... In, in Roman times. Although I, I would say that it did not start there because most of that area, the St. Julian and, and the upper reaches um, are of, of that particular region, of the Madoc region, um, were just swamp. Um, they were salt marshes. And the Dutch came in and drained them all. And that's, that's how you end up with these big, beautiful fields and stuff like that the dutch are very good about doing stuff like that technically and so this all of this was really great so he took me into this room and it was just magnificent and introduced me um uh to the owner of the of the place and we talked a little bit and i told him i was a writer and i had done this and done that and he he kind of recognized my name and all this other kind of stuff is maybe he did or maybe he didn't who knows but in any case he was very very gentle and very nice his old very much older man and and then we went outside and it was time for a break and it was a time to eat and they had these long tables out there and on the long tables there were carafes of red wine food and sandwiches and meats and 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 some seafood and all the rest of this stuff and it was just this giant salads just this giant meal that that all the workers would come and sit down and eat and drink well i probably drank a little too much because the rest of the afternoon i was a bit lethargic um mainly because for two reasons first of all I was happily drunk. Second of all, the fog had lifted and the intensity of the sun just warmed up so that it was drying out the the ground and there was like little moisture clouds rising up from the ground and like little, you know, shimmies of of white um, moisture and clouds and, and all the rest of this. And I was completely completely just done so I climbed on the bus as the sun was setting over the Atlantic Ocean slowly and the air sort of turned cold and 
I, I was very, very toasted, to say the least. I had a little pack with me that I was didn't realize that we were going to be fed at the Vendage and I had a, a sandwich that I had bought. And it was stuffed with a few bottles of uh, wine that the foreman had given me. And I was really quite content. I was more than quite content. I was just riding on a bus with a bunch of people from all around the world who had just worked very hard to get this wine um, into the distillery to create these memories. And these memories would be shared with people all over the world. It seemed to to just make um, it all the work and, and the history and, and the love that went into it and the love that surrounded the place um, even, even better. So I went back to the boat. Um, the next uh, day, was it was time to go. So I used my forward spring to get my bow out into the stream and I, we started at an awkward time. It was it was already high tide. And I had like, you know, an hour of the flow to the sea before it would would stop. And it would take me down the river at around four knots. Plus the speed that I was going down, I, you know, we were doing like seven, eight knots, easy. And um, we actually ended up... Uh, being very lucky as um, I came up upon a container ship um, who was just leaving and he just roared down the end uh, the estuary so we kind of got behind him and uh, by early evening we were um, heading south in the Atlantic we'd passed the lighthouse we'd passed all the shoals we'd passed all the silted sandy banks um, we could see the Bordeaux region and the vineyard from the Atlantic side, which is, uh, again, stunning. Um, the water changed from a uh, muddy river um, to clear, uh, green-like, cold Atlantic Ocean. And my hold was filled with wine. My fridge was filled with fresh food all the fresh food I could store. I had baguettes sticking everywhere. I was bountiful. I was absolutely bountiful. And if you like traveling and you like sailing your boat somewhere, I would recommend this trip. Whether you do the Vendage or not, doesn't matter. There's so much to do and so much to see. It's a wonderful place to put your boat, to navigate, and to learn I mean, just being, if I wanted to wander around the city of Bordeaux is, is worth a week's adventure. And especially when you have your house right next to the, moored right next to you. So this is a good thing. And thank you for listening. And I hope you have the chance to add Chateau Bechevel um, to your wine cellar and to um, maybe visit someday and enjoy. They have a beautiful restaurant inside now and it is very sophisticated very wonderful and has a tremendous um, connection to america which is also quite nice thank you That was a great story, Scott. You know, I've actually never been to Bordeaux. I mean, I've been to Provence and had a ton of wine from that region. But um, what what is the wine like out in Bordeaux? Well, the wine is ridiculously good. I mean, it is it is as I've tried to explain the combination of the food and wine, and and this is the best wine in the world. I don't care what people in California say. I don't care what people in Italy say or Spain. I don't, you know, it's all good. All, wine is, first of all, all wine is good. Some wines are better than others. But the style and the shape of the history, the memories that are in these, kind, in, in these Bordeaux wines, I mean, are just, 
they're just it's it's just an amazing if you if you love wine this is the place you need to go and there's so many great little tours you can do like chateau becheville has a you can go there and tour um the 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 winery and you can sit down and they they'll serve you a five course dinner with all sorts of different wines i mean there's chateau brion and and you know there's just so much history and what's the amazing thing is is that these vineyards I think Chateau, or um, yeah, Chateau Becheville is about 90 hectares. Um, it's not very big. Um, it's very long from the from the uh, the water, and it goes up. and And, and the homes, the the chateaus are just real chateaus. I mean, they're just gorgeous, and you can get lost in this beautiful idyllic place. It's just. I can't tell you, it's just, I bubble when I think about this stuff. Thank you for tuning in. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, be sure to rate and review. You can find us on Facebook and at offshoreexplorer.org. You can also listen to past episodes at offshore-explorer.simplecast.com. Our theme song is sung by Paulette McWilliams with additional music by Amanu Itomi and Tommy Twain. Until next time, fair winds and calm seas.